Good morning. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Out of thankfulness to God for giving us his word, at the end of the reading, I will conclude by saying, this is the word of the Lord, and invite you to respond, thanks be to God. Our passage this morning comes from Mark 1, 1 through 15. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Laura Grace. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ian. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at the King's Church. And uh, at this time, before we jump into the sermon, I want to go ahead and dismiss our uh, kids who are hanging out in Kingdom Kids today. Uh, we've got preschool over here to this door, K through 1 over here on this side. Parents, if you could help out your kids if they don't know where they're going. And uh, elementary, glad you guys are with us today in service. Uh, as Pastor Rob mentioned, we do have some clipboards available in the uh, connection room. Uh, feel free to grab one of those if it would be helpful uh, to follow along as we go. Well, excited this morning as we uh, discussed that we are going to be hopping into the Gospel of Mark, and I'm really excited to walk through a Gospel kind of from front to back. We've uh, looked at the Sermon on the Mount early on in the existence of the King's Church. Uh, We've looked at the parables of Jesus, if you've been around for a while, uh, but never actually just walked through a Gospel account. And so we just finished Ecclesiastes, and this is going to be a nice change of pace uh, just to pause and look at Jesus. So let me give you a little background before we uh, jump too far into this. Uh, The author of the Gospel of Mark is, as you might have guessed, uh, Mark. He's also known as a John Mark, though, in the scriptures. You might also realize why we call him Mark and not John Mark. Could be confusing with, you know, the other John that's there in the Gospels. Uh, interestingly, he was not one of the 12 uh, disciples or apostles, but Mark or John Mark starts showing up in the book of Acts. He's part of the uh, missionary journeys with Paul. In fact, you might remember there's a split between Paul and Barnabas over a guy named John Mark. That's the Mark that we're talking about. Uh, he was Barnabas's cousin. And church history tells us that uh, Mark became very close with Peter, and you could say that Mark is essentially the gospel of Peter. It has more information about Peter in it than any of the other gospel accounts, and it would make sense that someone who walked so closely with Jesus like Peter had some stories to tell. And Mark is the one who collects those stories and writes them for us. Now, parents in the room, uh, have you guys ever used the phrase to your kids, hey, you better keep up? Because I do that all the time with my daughter Maddie, specifically. Uh, She's adorable, she's got these big glasses, big brown eyes, and she could not be bothered to care about time, okay? And in fact, the more in a rush we are in, the more she just wants to settle back and walk at her own little pace, okay? Uh, If we, we didn't have a tagline for this gospel that we're walking through, but if we wanted to do that, you could say the gospel of Mark, you better keep up. Because Mark is quick. I mean, there is an urgency to his writing. Mark is the gospel of action. He is not one to mince words. He gets right down to it. Everything is urgent. His favorite word in this gospel is immediately. He says immediately 41 times. It's like we're reading the Usain Bolt F1 car version of the gospel. I mean, Mark is just go, 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 go. He is focused on the action of Jesus 
more so than the teachings of Jesus, though he does include portions of that. And Mark's purpose in writing, in line with that kind of pace, is fittingly right here in verse 1. Look at verse 1. He says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is Mark's thesis statement. Remember, in English class, we're getting ready to go back to school, so maybe this is a good refresher, right? In English class, you want to write your thesis statement for the paper. If you had to boil it all down, what is it? Here it is from Mark. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning, by the way, parallels us back to another book that starts with, in the beginning, Genesis. Mark is saying there's a new creation coming in this gospel account. There's a continuity to what has come before, but something new is on the scene. That new thing is the gospel. Pastor Rob already gave the introduction to this part, right? The gospel literally means the good news. It was used as an announcement of a victory of war. Just imagine if you can before social media and phones and things like that. If your country was at battle, how would you know if you won or not? Well, what you would do is you would have watchmen who were looking on the horizon. They were looking for a herald who would run back. And what are you waiting for? Gospel. Good news. Did we win the victory or not? And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name, by the way. Christ is a title. It means Messiah. He is the divine Son of God, which is Mark's favorite designation for Jesus. See, Mark is telling us the story of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And he's telling us that Jesus is both the continuation of what has come before him and the culmination of God's plan of redemption. As we walk through these first 15 verses today, We're going to really set up this gospel account that we're going to be walking through uh, for a long time here at the King's Church. So this morning, here is our main idea from this introductory section to Mark. God's plan of salvation culminates in the coming of Christ, inviting us to repentance and faith. God's plan of salvation culminates in the coming of Christ, inviting us to repentance and faith. Before we jump in, though, let's pray together and ask God to bless our time in his word. Father, we thank you for the chance it is to gather back here in this place this morning to uh, set aside all the things that we are carrying into this morning, all of the burdens we might have in our lives, the struggles with sin and temptation that cling so closely, the reminders of suffering and sickness and diagnosis and brokenness and all the things that we experience in this fallen world. I pray as we walk into this place with all of those things this morning that you would help us to recenter our attention and our focus on Jesus Christ. Help us to be reminded of the good news of the gospel of Jesus, the Son of God. And as we sit in this, may you, in strength, may you strengthen and empower us to walk this life of discipleship faithfully along the path that you have set forth. So Holy Spirit, this morning, may you give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to respond in a fresh way to the good news of the gospel. Draw us in your kindness to faith and repentance, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're just going to kind of follow three kind of characters this morning in these first 15 verses. We're going to look at the forerunner, and then the son, and then the king. Okay, let's begin with the forerunner. You'll notice that the beginning of Mark's gospel does not include wise men or shepherds, or angelic appearances like Matthew and Luke. And remember, Mark doesn't have time for those things, okay? Mark instead jumps right in with the figure of John the Baptist. And in this, Mark is drawing our attention to the fact that the coming of both John and Jesus are part of a plan that was set in motion in eternity past by the triune God to bring about salvation. And John the Baptist plays a critical role in this. See, just as Jesus was promised, so too was John. Look at verses 2 and 3. Mark says, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Mark here is combining several Old Testament promises with the most prominent being in Isaiah, which is why he mentions Isaiah. But the first actually comes from the book of Malachi. Now, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. We have to appreciate that after Malachi, 
there is 400 years of silence from God. He is no longer communicating to his people through the prophets as he had done so for so many years prior. In Malachi, it's a short little book, it is dripping with warnings of judgment because of the apathy of the people of God, but it also includes a few glimmers of promise, and one of those is found in Malachi 3.1, a promise of a messenger that is to come who will prepare the way for the Lord, who will suddenly appear in his temple. And then in the last two verses of the Old Testament, we're told that this messenger will come like the prophet Elijah. He will come in the spirit and in the pattern of Elijah who will turn the hearts of God's people back to the Lord. And Mark is telling us this is John the Baptist. Then in verse 3, Mark quotes Isaiah 40. This is a famous chapter in the Bible. Isaiah 40 are the first words of God to his people who now are in exile in Babylon. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah is God warning his people of judgment because they are worshiping idols. They are following after false gods. They are following the pattern of the nations around them. He invites them over and over again, repent, repent, come back, otherwise exile is coming. And then it happens. And the first words that God sends to his people in exile are comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. And then it goes to what's here in verse 3. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. You see, in the ancient uh, Eastern world, when a dignitary or a king or a queen would come and visit from a faraway place, they didn't just take the roads that already existed. No, because of the honor and the respect of the royalty that was coming, you know what the people did? They built new roads. They built new highways. They made a new way. You can still see this in countries like Africa. You'll hear about the king's way. That's because one time the king came our direction, and what did we do? We paved him a new road. And that's the picture of Isaiah 43, and that's the picture of Mark 1-3. There is a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight a highway for God. Royalty was indeed coming. The old roads won't do. The old ways need to go in a different direction. And the beauty of this promise is that God wasn't sending a representative in his stead to his people. No, God himself was coming. And Mark is telling us this is happening. John is the voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the people for the arrival of God. Mark begins his gospel by reminding us God has made promises. And though it looks like they may not be coming true, though it's been 400 years of fracturing in Israel, of now being occupied by the Romans, God is keeping his promises. John the Baptist is coming, and he is the promised forerunner for something and someone even greater. Look at verse 4 and following. Mark says, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now let's be honest for just a minute. This morning, John's kind of a strange dude, right? Like he'd be your crunchy friend today, without a doubt. I mean, he looks weird. He's eating locusts. Like I hope the honey to locust ratio was high on the honey. Like it's just kind of a strange appearance. He's out in the middle of nowhere. But none of this is accidental. You see, if you go back and read about the prophet Elijah, he looks and sounds just like Elijah. Elijah dressed in the same funny way, and he gave the same funny message to the people of God. And what is that message that John is giving? It's quite simple. John's uh, that preacher who's got one sermon. Like, you show up to church, and you're like, all right, well, we know it's coming. Buckle up, right? John's one sermon, his one message is what? Repent. Repentance. John is saying, turn from the path that you are walking on and join in on a new path in a different direction. Repentance is the humble acknowledgement that you are missing the mark. And it doesn't mean just acknowledging that, it means a turn. 
it means a 180 degree switch of direction. If you're going this way, turn around and go the other way. Repentance means charting a new way in your heart and in your life for the Lord who is coming. The old way just won't do. John over and over again said, repent, repent. And to accompany this repentance, he is baptizing people. This baptism was a symbol of repentance. It was symbolic to show the cleansing that comes with repentance, the inner cleansing. It's a picture of having a clean heart before God. The washing of your body shows the inner renewal that you are committing to the Lord in repentance. And the only way to repentance, brothers and sisters, is the way of humility. And John the Baptist both preaches this and embodies this. He preaches, listen, one greater than me will come. And the strap of his sandals, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie. In the ancient world, to untie somebody's sandals so you could wash their feet was the job of a Gentile servant. But yet here's John the Baptist, the long-promised messenger of God. And what does he do? He takes up the posture of a servant. John 3.30 quotes John the Baptist as saying, He must increase, Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. Step one of repentance, brothers and sisters, is he must increase, I must decrease. And when that Jesus comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit a power that we all need to live out our life of repentance. Mark is telling us John breaks the 400 years of silence. And when God comes with a message to his people through John, he looks at them and he says, listen, you're missing it, and there's another way. You're missing it, but there's a better way. And friends, that message is for us too. Every single one of us in this room have also missed it. And we will not receive the gospel, the good news, unless we realize that we are in need of good news. If we go through life resisting this call to repentance, if we go through life thinking we've got it all together, this will not be good news for us. In fact, the people in the gospel of Mark who resist that never get Jesus. They push back against him. All of us need a fresh start. All of us need to be made new. We need to clear the path of our own hearts and lives to receive the king who is coming. And the only way to do that is through humble repentance. Ray Ortland, in his commentary on Isaiah, says this. He says that the word translated prepare there in verse 3 means to clear out like a spring cleaning. Glory and clutter don't go together. So Isaiah and John the Baptist are saying the king is coming with blessing in his hands for you. So... Empty your hands. Clear away the obstacles to his glory entering your world. God is not calling us to pedal faster. He is calling us to open up. He is calling us to repentance. Maybe you're here this morning and you've heard that Christianity is about pedaling faster. Let me encourage you to stop pedaling. And instead, open up your heart and your lives to repentance. That is the forerunner. Next we'll see the sun. This section is going to tell us three crucial things about Jesus as the Son of God. It's going to tell us that the Son is divine, that the Son will suffer, and that the Son will identify with his people. Let's first look at the Son is divine from the baptism of Jesus. Look at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. In this baptism of Jesus, we see three signs, three things that converge, that are meant to trigger us who know the Bible to a bigger story. When Jesus comes up out of the water, Mark says that he sees the heavens being torn open. Notice the violence of that language, by the way. None of the other gospel writers say that. The heavens are torn open. This is intentional and unique to Mark. You see, that word is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to signify something big is going on. God is showing up in a major way. So that word shows up, for example, when Moses 
uh, lifts his staff, and then God divides the Red Sea. Literally, the seas are torn open. When they're in the wilderness and Moses strikes the rock and water rushes from it, it says the rock was torn open. God is entering earthly space, doing something new, doing something cataclysmic, and that's happening here. The chasm between heaven and earth, God's space and our space, ripped open. And heaven and earth are colliding in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Mark's going to use this idea of torn open one more time in his gospel. It's at the end. Here's the spoiler alert to the end of the gospel. Jesus is crucified. He cries out his last. And you know what happens? The temple curtain, torn, top to bottom. What does that signify? Access to God. The baptism is saying, God has come for you. Heaven and earth are now meeting in Jesus Christ. Jesus is baptized. Heaven is torn open. The event is supposed to jump off the page to us to say, pay attention. Something is going on here. The second sign is that the Spirit descends upon, or literally, into Jesus like a dove, Mark says. There's an intensity of the union between the Spirit and Jesus here, and this was the expectation of the Jewish people for a Messiah to come. One day, the very Spirit of God that spoke through the prophets would one day empower the Messiah and the Christ in his mission. And again, though Mark is brief, the language is loaded. The language is intentional. He's saying that the spirit descending on him like a dove is similar to what happened back at creation. Remember, Mark also introduced creation in the beginning. Now, this is the beginning of the gospel. Well, back in creation, Genesis 1-2 tells us that the spirit was doing what? Hovering over the face of the waters, just like a dove would. And now, at the baptism of Jesus, the same spirit who hovered at creation now hovers over the new creation that Jesus is bringing into the world. And there's a third sign, the voice from heaven of God the Father. He declares to Jesus that he is his beloved son. That is a rich analogy in the Old Testament to this coming in Isaiah of a servant who would be like a son. It's the son of Psalm 2 who rules and reigns as king. Only the nation of Israel had been called God's son before this. But now Jesus comes as God himself in the flesh as the divine son of God. And by the way, it's not like God's just adopting Jesus in this moment. No, this has always been the case from eternity past. And God is declaring it over this baptism. As we step back, we realize Mark is telling us the baptism of Jesus is the recapitulation of the creation story itself. I mean, think about it. What happens at creation? God the Father speaks creation into existence. The Spirit hovers over the waters. And Colossians 1 tells us that by Jesus, the Son, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. He is the agent of creation. And Mark is saying just as creation was the project of the triune God, so too is redemption. We have creation and new creation, and all of it is happening according to plan, and all of it is converging on Jesus. Jesus is the divine Son of God. But secondly, we learn, maybe surprisingly, that the Son will suffer. If you're unfamiliar with the story, what comes next may feel like a surprise. Verse 12. The Spirit immediately, there's Mark's favorite word, immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. This does feel surprising after all because after his baptism, he's declared to be the Son of God, the one whom all the promises are wrapped up in. They find their yes and amen in this Christ, this Messiah, this Son who has come. We'd expect him to do what? Go to Jerusalem. Go to Rome. The king has come. There's a new regime in town. But instead, Jesus goes to literally the most opposite place that he could. He goes to the wilderness. And he's driven there. Again, the intensity of the language. Driven there by the Spirit. He's not there by accident. It's not a detour. He is precisely where he is supposed to be. Because listen, we've seen this pattern before, haven't we? What happens after creation? A temptation. What happens after God splits the Red Sea and 
leads the people out of, the, of Egypt on an exodus. They go to the wilderness where they face temptation and trials for 40 years nonetheless. Jesus is coming in fulfilling that story. Now, when you hear wilderness, we often think like national parks, right? Like those of you who love the great outdoors are like, oh, this kind of sounds like fun. I don't think it's fun either way. I'm just going to be honest. I love the great indoors. Okay, the air conditioning is working great this morning. Praise be to God. Okay, but if you're thinking like Yosemite National Park, that's the wrong idea. It means desert. I mean, it means like the middle of nowhere. By the way, I love Mark. All the actions happen in the middle of nowhere, in the desert. It means the barren place. And the place of the wilderness and the desert is so significant in the Bible. It's the place of testing and trials, but it's also the place of emptiness. It's the training ground for how God's people learn to live dependent upon the Lord. Because it is the place where unless God shows up, you will die. And that's why it's precisely the place where God so often meets his people whether it be a burning bush, whether it be bread from heaven, whether it be water from a rock, whether it be in great power and glory on top of a mountain. The wilderness is the place of trial and testing, and it's also the place where God meets his people. And listen, brothers and sisters, this morning, if you want to meet Jesus, you're going to have to go out to the wilderness as well. You're going to need to find yourself in the place where you are dependent holy upon the Lord, where all the self-sufficiency that we convince ourselves that we have and all the distractions of this life are stripped away. You're going to need to find your place where if God doesn't show up, I am in trouble. All the actions in the desert, it's all in the wilderness, and we meet Jesus there. And Jesus is entering into the same story of the Bible told again, but we can't miss the difference. Jesus, the second Adam, succeeds where the first failed. And where Israel, as the first son of God, failed in their wilderness test, Jesus, as the divine son of God, will not fail. We know from Matthew and Luke, by the way, that this is precisely the temptation that Satan is giving to Jesus. He starts the temptations, if you are really the son of God, are you sure that's who you are? Are you sure that you can trust your father? And where Adam failed, and where Israel failed, Jesus does not. He resists. But this is telling us, maybe startlingly this morning, that the path of where Jesus is walking is immediately forged by suffering. It's right out the gates. And in the Gospel of Mark, this makes everybody uncomfortable. I mean, Peter, our friend Peter, remember when Jesus tells him, listen, Peter, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified. Peter says, never. And Jesus rebukes him. Get behind me, Satan path that this king is walking is a path of suffering. This is not the way we might have expected, but Jesus will win the cosmic conflict through suffering and hardship, not in spite of it. The son will suffer. But thirdly, the son identifies with his people. There's one final thread I want to tug on here with Jesus as the son. That's the theme of identification. We see this in both his baptism and temptation. You might be wondering, why does Jesus get baptized? You ever wondered that before? It's a baptism of repentance, after all, and Jesus is sinless. Why does he get baptized by John? It's a good question. Well, in one sense, it establishes his identity. It inaugurates his public ministry, but I think there's more going on. By going under the waters of baptism, which the waters in Scripture are usually waters of judgment, By going under those waters and coming out and being baptized, he is identifying himself with sinners and sufferers. In his baptism, Jesus is sharing with us the circumstances in which we become aware of our need for repentance. And Jesus has come to meet those needs. He makes it possible for sinners to repent and find forgiveness and new life in him. His baptism from the beginning ties him to that mission. He identifies with sinners and sufferers. And we also see this in the temptation. You might be asking, what's up with the wild animals? I mean, that doesn't show up in the other accounts. It says that Jesus was with the wild animals. Why is that there? Well, most people argue that Mark is writing to suffering Christians in Rome. 
And at the time of Mark's writing, the church in Rome is undergoing persecution. You see, in 64 AD, there was a massive fire that broke out in Rome. It raged for six days until it was put out, and 10 of the 14 districts in Rome were almost completely annihilated. And the emperor at the time, a guy named Nero, maybe you've heard of him, a bit of a loose cannon, to put it lightly, he blames the Christians. He sees this kind of weird new group starting up, and he shifts the blame on them, even though there's no evidence, and then his punishment, his persecution was ruthless of them. Listen to what the Roman historian Tacitus says. He says, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of wild beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. We also know that Christians were martyred in the Roman Colosseum <clears throat> by wild animals as well, while people watched on for entertainment. And Mark is writing to a people where that is their faced reality, and what does he say? Jesus was with the wild animals. Jesus is reminding his readers that he is with them in their struggle. Jesus knows firsthand their warfare in the spiritual battle at play. Jesus identifies with you in your suffering and you can identify with him. He is not aloof and unaware. He is a man of sorrows well acquainted with our suffering. Maybe you resonate with that this morning. Maybe you're in a season of suffering and you wonder if God cares and we see Jesus with the wild animals. And Hebrews 4 reminds us that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So what's the invitation to you this morning? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. This morning, go to the throne of grace. Jesus sympathizes with us. He identifies with us. He is the son who is divine, the son who will suffer, and the son who identifies. But that's not all. He also is the king. I want to conclude our time this morning in verses 14 and 15. This is the gospel in a nutshell, and it's also the rest of the book of Mark. So we're going to just dip our toes in the water this morning. But this is the trajectory for Jesus and the trajectory of this gospel account. Look at verse 14. Now, After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus comes and proclaims, after his time in the wilderness, the gospel of God. Now, when this word gospel was used in that Greco-Roman world, it always was in the plural. It was a piece of good news amongst all the other good news that might be out there in the world. But Jesus comes and he says, no, no, I'm proclaiming to you the gospel, singular, of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not one piece of good news among many others. It always appears in the singular because the scriptures tell us the good news is entirely and fully wrapped up in Jesus Christ. All other good news falls infinitely short of the good news of the gospel of God in Jesus Christ. And the contents of this gospel, according to Jesus, are this. The time is fulfilled. History has been building to this moment. This moment in Galilee is loaded and charged with significance. I mean, we know this to be true in our own lives, too. Not all dates or moments are created equal. I mean, we know in theory, right, every, like, minute has 60 seconds, every hour is 60 minutes. Like, it's all created equal, but there are some moments that have a weight to them, don't they? I mean, a birth of a child, a wedding day, a graduation, a remembrance of a date where you've lost a loved one, those have a different feel to them, don't they? And Jesus says, this moment right now, it better feel different. The time is fulfilled. And he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. And the reason why is because the king has come. God's rule and reign over all things has now come to earth in flesh and blood. And the rest of Mark's gospel is going to be teaching about the kingdom and the king. Probably fitting for the King's Church, right? We actually preached those two verses our very first service. The rest of the gospel is going to be about the upside-down kingdom of God 
and the unlikely King Jesus. Because this kingdom that has come, the world can't make sense of. It doesn't operate by the same categories and principles. No, it's something altogether different. And the king comes not to ascend a throne and assert his power over all things. No, he comes to be enthroned on a cross. And this kingdom, friends, has already come with Jesus' arrival here in Mark chapter 1. But it also has not yet come because we await his return again in the future. In many ways, we sit hearing the same message that those in Galilee did. Today, I can tell you the same thing, that the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom has come, and it will come. The king has come, and he will return. And how do we respond to the king's past and future coming? It's the same thing as John the Baptist. What does Jesus say? Repent. Repent and believe in the gospel. I think sometimes when we hear repent, we think like a weird guy on a street corner yelling at us to get our act together. Maybe that's even how you think about John the Baptist. But that's not what repentance is in the scriptures. And that's not the motivation for repentance, by the way. You know what the motivation for repentance is in the scriptures? Romans 2 says that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Think, yes, crazy guy on the street corner telling you to repent or burn. And think more, a savior, arms outstretched, saying, I see you've made a mess of things, but come to me. Turn away from all those other things and come to me. Declutter your life. Prepare the way of the Lord in your own heart. Repent. Turn. Repentance is not simply confessing our sins. It's not feeling sorry for the consequences of what we've done. It's not just feeling sorry for yourself and making commitments to change your behavior. No, it is a complete turnaround. Stop doing what you're doing and turn the other direction. And that turning is what we call faith. Repentance and faith are the twin responses to the gospel. We turn away from our sin and then we turn toward our Savior. Repentance, faith. Faith is rightly esteeming Jesus for who he is, not who we might think him to be or want him to be. It is the idea of putting all your chips in on Jesus. To shift the weight of your life and the expectations you might have for this world squarely on him and on no one else. And as we live that life, repentance and faith is the entryway to the kingdom, but it also is the road that we walk to stay in the kingdom, to walk with our Savior Jesus. Repent and believe your Savior's kindness is inviting you to that. Here's how the great Charles Spurgeon talks about repentance and faith. He says, this is how true Christians live. They repent as bitterly for sin as if they knew they should be condemned for it, but they rejoice as much in Christ as if sin were nothing at all. Oh, how blessed it is to know where these two lines meet, the stripping of repentance and the clothing of faith. The repentance that ejects sin as an evil tyrant and the faith which admits Christ to be the sole master of the heart. The repentance which purges the soul from dead works and the faith that fills the soul with living works. The repentance that pulls down the faith which builds up. The repentance which ordains a time to weep and the faith that gives a time to dance. These two things together make up the work of grace within. I don't know if you know this, but I also only have one sermon. And it's the good news of Jesus. And every week, all of my application is some version of repentance and faith. Because no matter who you are in this room, that is what God is calling you to. The King has come. The long-awaited Christ and Son of God has come. He has come to suffer and die in our place and to usher in an upside-down kingdom marked by a resurrection kind of life that nobody expected. So this morning... If you don't know Jesus as your king, in his kindness, he is inviting you, turn the other direction. I beg you this morning, run to a throne of grace, not a throne of judgment, and find mercy and help. And if you're here and Jesus is your king, repentance and faith is the path we walk moment by moment, day by day. So let's link arms together, stop acting like you're okay, and let's repent and believe the gospel. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have come, that you have fulfilled all of the promises of God, 
and that you are inviting us by your grace and your grace alone to walk in a new kind of way in you. So Lord, we thank you for this gospel. We thank you for the reminders of the good news of Jesus. May it be the good news in our life. May we not hedge our bets on other things we might think are gospel, but instead put all of our weight and all of the chips of our life in on you, Jesus. Where we're missing the mark, where we have strayed down other ways and other paths, draw us back in your kindness to this life of repentance and faith. Help us to respond with humble gratitude and worship to you for who you are and what you've done. And for those who don't know you here in this room, open their hearts and their eyes to see and believe the good news of Jesus. And for those who know you, may you strengthen those who feel weak. For those who are ready to throw in the towel, remind them of what is true. For those who are suffering, remind us that you are a sympathetic high priest. And more more than anything else, remind us that life comes after death in the gospel. That we await a resurrection to come. And Jesus, you have gone that path before us. Help us believe that fresh today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.